All right, guys. Uh, welcome back to take care of our review for a push period six. Uh, now, period six is is significantly important. It's going to end up constituting approximately thirteen percent of your AP final exam. Uh, it's going to cover the years 1865 to 1898. So just to put that in its proper context, really the end of the Civil War, although some of the legislation that takes place during the Civil War is going to have a big impact on period six, uh, all the way through to 1898 with the onset of uh, American imperialism. Uh, so it's going to cover a, co a couple important themes, a couple important big ideas. Uh, the first is the rise, uh, the increase, the growth of industrial America. Uh, really the the sequel to the market revolution with the industrial revolution uh, it's going to cover the last west so this closing of the frontier the last real westward push in America uh, and then with it a bunch of Native American conflicts as well as an attempt in some ways at a new south uh, something going to remain the same in the south some things are going to be significantly new uh, with industrialization we're going to have a huge growth of urbanization as people move to cities both via internal migration so leaving rural and farm areas to go to cities as well as external immigration uh, people coming from eastern and southern Europe and largely settling in our cities uh, to the point that by 1920 more than half of Americans actually live in cities uh, which is a, a big shift from earlier in American history probably would have made Thomas Jefferson very upset uh, and finally we'll talk about the politics of the Gilded Age uh, not a ton happens politically on the national level as both parties kind of just keep the status quo uh, and a lot of the issues of, of political nature get settled in cities and in states. Cool. Now, by the end of this time period, America's going to become the biggest industrial power in the world in terms of manufacturing capacity, in terms of investment capital, in terms of overall economic strength. Uh, the U.S. economy will have industrialized at a, a huge rapid rate with a couple factors that really matter towards industrialization. Uh, the first is access to raw materials. The U.S. has a, well, we have a lot of land, uh, and with a lot of land comes a lot of natural resources, uh, a lot of which are necessary for the industrial process. Uh, things like oil, uh, iron, coal, lead, timber, all kinds of raw materials are going to be found in different places throughout the U.S., which are going to help fuel this industrial process. The second factor is labor supply. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of workers, especially post-Civil War, as uh, we, we, we demobilize the wartime economy and we see a huge influx of immigrants. There's a lot of available labor in the U.S., which helps fuel industrialization as well. Now, unfortunately for that labor, because there's so many of them, uh, they are largely replaceable. Uh, when there's a lot of workers, then it's easy to find new workers, which makes it easier to treat your existing workers not so well. That'll be an issue in period six as well. Uh, the third factor, of course, is a, a growing population, uh, which goes into our labor supply conversation. Uh, that's happening because of, of post-Civil War uh, population booms. Uh, that's largely fueled by immigration uh, in the years after 1865, but also the, the remnants of our last wave of immigration uh, from the 1830s and 40s. There's a lot of people, and the population is, is growing at a rapid rate, and so is our infrastructure uh, between the transcontinental railroad and then later the transcontinental railroads, um, as well as new technology. It's much easier to get people and goods and supplies uh, from point A to point B, which also helps fuel industrialization. Uh, the fourth is, is this idea of capital and investment. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of money. Uh, Europeans are also investing in U.S. businesses, um, which allows for more investment and more growth, uh, followed by technology. Uh, we have a ton of new technology uh, in the years after 1865, things like the Bessemer process, um, that allow for greater industrial capacity. Uh, and also, it really would, would be faulty to not point out the role the government plays in industrialization. Uh, through period six, through the Gilded Age, uh, we're going to have very laissez-faire, hands-off policies towards the regulation of business. Uh, we see very, very little even attempts to regulate big business and industrialism. Uh, but at the same time, 
the government's going to enact a bunch of policies that are pro-business. So they're going to keep their hands off of business in terms of regulating them, while also promoting policies that are encouraging business, things uh, like tariffs, which encourage American industrialism, things like uh, land subsidies or land giveaways for railroads, which encourage railroad expansion, um, patents, allowing for businesses to, to own uh, portions of their existing industry, as well as uh, very, very limited taxes, uh, low taxes on corporate profits. So that's one of the things that's going to piss off the farmers uh, when we see things like the farmers being taxed on their land, but big business not being taxed on their profit, and the farmers saying, hey, that's not fair. We should start a new party. Let's call it the populace. Uh, and then the final real big factor that makes it, plays a role in U.S. industrialization is entrepreneurs. People like Vanderbilt, people like Rockefeller, people like uh, – there's a, a variety of them that, that take a small amount of capital and they invest it in themselves and they end up with big business that then is uh, transformative for the U.S. economy. Now, uh, the first real big nationwide business in American history are the railroads. Now, that, of course, uh, is a, a large factor in the Union's victory in the Civil War. Uh, as, as the North and the West have more railroads, have more infrastructure, have more interconnectivity. Um, but after the Civil War, we see a couple important things. First is the standardization of gauges. So it doesn't sound that much fun. It's not that much fun. But it's this idea that now uh, railroad tracks will be the same width anywhere you go in the world. It's not the world, excuse me. Anywhere you go in the nation. Uh, so that, of course, encourages more rail travel because it's, it's easier. It's, it's more smooth. Uh, the South also gets on board with that. Finally, uh, but the real thing that starts spreading railroads so significantly are federal land grants. Uh, the idea that the government should give away land to railroad companies uh, in the West in exchange for those railroad companies building a railroad on that land. Uh, then the railroad companies have the opportunity to sell back that land to people that are settling. And then the, the federal government will get that money back in, in taxes uh, and westward expansion and infrastructure. Uh, but with these federal land grants, they often breed corruption. Uh, we see that, uh, for example, in the Credit Mobilier scandal, uh, uh, an example of bribing government officials uh, to to get as much land as possible and profit as much land as possible. Uh, but we do see, because of the federal land grants, a series of transcontinental railroads, which you can see down here, uh, which are going to kind of crisscross the whole western United States, uh, connecting places like Seattle in the uh, far northwest with Chicago. Uh, and Los Angeles with Texas and New Orleans, and then everything in between. Uh, so now, it's, it's, once it becomes so much easier to get from, from the West Coast to the East Coast, that's going to facilitate a lot of travel, a lot of trade, a lot of raw materials, um, being able to, to exchange. Uh, and then eventually, we're going to see the problems with the oversaturation of railroads, having too many railroads, and then uh, inability to... Uh, sell tickets on all of them or move goods on all of them. And that's going to cause things like the Panic of 1893. Uh, and then with that, all these railroad businesses are going to be worth basically nothing. And that's where we're going to see really smart businessmen like J.P. Morgan and the likes, uh, N.J. Gould, capitalizing on financial panics to buy up railroads for cheap and then have control of the entire railroad business. So uh, in, in similar fashion to what happens with railroads, we also see uh, a couple different industries being really controlled by, by either one company, one man, or a small group of companies and men. Uh, the first is steel. Uh, now, Andrew Carnegie, he's going to bring the Bessemer process uh, from Europe, uh, which is going to, for the first time in American history, allow for high quality steel to be made at a, at a lower rate than steel. Steel's always been around, it's just incredibly expensive to make. The Bessemer process is gonna change that. Uh, now Carnegie's gonna use a, a bunch of, of land and railroad and infrastructure and opportunities to kinda corner the market or have a nice monopoly on steel. And it's gonna be his steel that's gonna really fuel the uh, upward expansion of American cities as well as the railroads, as well as uh, much of the uh, the bridges and other infrastructure that is going to happen for the for United States expansion, uh, and he's going to have his his monopoly on steel through what's called vertical integration. So taking steel from.
from its very raw material roots and controlling every step of the process all the way to distribution, not relying on any middlemen uh, to get your raw materials or to sell your goods, but to rather control the entire process. Uh, John Rockefeller is going to do a very similar thing with oil. And Rockefeller is going to uh, use an approach that's uh, called horizontal integration. And it's similar, but it's different in, in a sense that what he's going to do is he's going to uh, manipulate the market and undercut competitors cost-wise by selling oil cheaper than they can sell for to put his competitors out of business or to encourage his competitors to sell their oil refineries to him. And he's going to use horizontal integration or buying up all of your competitors in a, in a given industry so that you control the entire market that way. So both Carnegie and Rockefeller really are groundbreaking in the ways in which they approach business, uh, but they both get incredibly, incredibly rich through it. Uh, and we see other companies like sugar, tobacco, meat, also organizing into horizontal integrations or trusts, uh, similar to Rockefeller. And we see other companies even to today using vertical integration. A lot of fashion companies and shoe companies are going to do the same thing in which they control the raw materials, the production, and the distribution. Uh, so they really are both groundbreaking business approaches that change the way we do business in America. Um, now, there's going to be a, a response to these monopolies and what's called the antitrust or anti-monopoly uh, movement uh, in which society is looking at how rich and powerful these people are and realizing that it's not good for the long-term future of our country to have the rich be absolutely as rich as they are and nobody else. Uh, so the government begins attempting to act. Uh, they pass the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is largely ineffective. Um, it ends up being used against the unions more than it is against big business, but it's a, it's a start. Uh, as well as the Interstate Commerce Act, which creates the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, but of course, the Supreme Court and and government's going to side with big business almost at almost every turn at this point. Uh, one example being the Supreme Court case, the U.S. versus E. C. Knight, which applied that this Sherman Antitrust Act can only be applied to commerce or trade, not to actually uh, industry. Uh, so that kind of goes against controlling Rockefeller or Carnegie. And it, the, here's the Supreme Court again ruling in favor of big business, not in favor of the people. Now, a couple of things that really justify this, this huge expansion of wealth and this huge consolidation of wealth. Uh, the first is Adam Smith uh, and his very important uh, book or, or piece of writing called The Wealth of Nations. Now, it was published in 1776, so way before any of this is taking place. But it's going to argue that the government should play no role in uh, the economy or in business, uh, but the, gov that the economy will be regulated by what's called the invisible hand. This invisible hand of supply and demand uh, that when the people want more of something, then the demand increases and therefore the supply increases as well. When the people want less of something, then the demand increases and the supply decreases or we, ha or we have to change the prices. But the government shouldn't regulate business. Supply and demand should regulate it. Uh, and the government should keep its hands off. Uh, businesses are going to be motivated by their own self-interest to offer the best goods and services they can to make the most amount of money, uh, which is a cute theory. Uh, it just doesn't quite work that way in practice because humans. Uh, the second justification is uh, social Darwinism, uh, pushed by two men, Herbert Spencer and a William Graham Sumner, uh, that argue that, well, the way these, these businesses are rich and these people are poor because of their own decisions and actions and their abilities and skills. So to interfere with that, to, to regulate business or to give handouts to people or to to force uh, businesses to take good care of their of their workers would to get in the way of the evolutionary process uh, that it would be it would interfere with the laws of nature and weaken evolution of humans to to help out people that don't deserve being helped out uh, so social Darwinism is a big argument in favor of not forcing companies to treat their workers well or pay them well or giving out handouts to people that need it uh, the third is the gospel of wealth. It's super important. I suggest you know it well. Uh, it's championed by people like Rockefeller. Um, and he, he's going to argue that people have a duty to get rich. And then once they get rich, they got rich because God blessed them with, with their hard work and their skill and their ability and some luck. Uh, once they are rich, they have uh, to then turn around and 
use that rich, uh, use those riches or that richness uh, to enrich society through philanthropic projects. So scholarships, libraries, schools. So not necessarily giving handouts to people, but giving people access to opportunities to improve themselves if they so choose. Um, I'm sorry, it's Carnegie, not Rockefeller. Great. Terrible mistake. Um, and Carnegie is going to actually practice what he preaches and distribute even in, in 1890s money over $350 million of his own goods uh, to libraries all over the world and scholarships and, and music halls and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, but that doesn't quite justify the fact that he got that rich by paying his workers almost nothing uh, and, you know, treating them terribly. Uh, and the fourth philosophy or justification is consumer goods. Um, a lot of people look at the world and say, well, like, yeah, people are working really hard and they don't have much money, but the middle class is doing quite well and the upper class is doing quite well and we have more access to goods. Uh, we, we start shifting to a consumer-based culture in the Gilded Age that's going to continue through the 1920s. Uh, for the first time, we have Macy's, uh, another department store called Woolworths. Uh, people are consuming Beef, because of progress made in the Gilded Age in transportation and transporting the beef, and as well as things like barbed wire that keeps the cows in place. Uh, and so the first time we have a real consumer culture in which people have access to goods they want, people are going to look at that as, as justification for the working conditions and the treatment by saying, well, yeah, but look how much better our society as a whole is because of industrialization. Now, through this, uh, we're going to see a big struggle for... Uh, our labor, our, our workers, uh, to be able to make any sort of progress. But really the big struggle is that they are too replaceable. Uh, the Most of the labor is unskilled, which means you don't have to be well-trained or have any special ability to do the job. Uh, and there's because of immigration and because of population growth, there's just so many people that want to work that it's hard to have any, any real bargaining power. Um, so labor is going to try to begin organizing into unions, and they're going to struggle against a couple things uh, because big business and the government is going to really be anti-labor at the beginning. Uh, first is the use of lockouts or closing factories to make sure that labor cannot get organized, right? Can't organize if you can't work. Uh, second is blacklists or, or distributing names of employ names to other employers of, of employees that you think are pro-union. Third are yellow dog contracts or being told that you need to uh, sign a contract when you get a job that you will not join a union. The fourth is more aggressive, uh, the Pinkertons and the other um, state militias or private guards that are called out to violently, uh, with force, put down any attempt to strike. Uh, we see big business using injunctions or court rulings to stop strikes, as well as public opinion. Uh, it's going to be big business that's pushing the idea throughout society and throughout the next 40 years that organized labor is anarchy or organized labor is socialism or organized labor is communism. And therefore, public opinion is not really going to side with them. And when you don't have the public's opinion on your side, it's very difficult to, to make great progress. Uh, we see this uh, most clearly. Uh, really, this, this issue of organized labor in the Gilded Age comes to a head with the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, uh, which is, is a terrible outbreak of labor violence. Uh, it happens during the Panic of 1873. Uh, people have no money. Uh, the railroad cuts their wages. Um, they have about half a million people on strike from either railroads all over the country and other industries uh, striking in solidarity. Uh, and our president, Rutherford B. Hayes, who, of course, has just been elected via that uh, contested election that ends Reconstruction, uh, he sends the National Guard. Over 100 people die. Uh, but it does really bring to a head the struggle of organized labor. Despite the struggle, though, we still have a, a three important labor unions you should know uh, that attempt to make progress for labor on a national scale. The first is the National Labor Union. Uh, it's founded in 1866. By 1868, it has over half a million members. Uh, what are they pushing for? Like every single labor union, they're pushing for an eight-hour workday and higher wages. Uh, they also push for equal rights for women, uh, equal rights for African Americans. <clears throat> Eventually, uh, they do one of their big wins is they do get the eight-hour workday uh, as law for all federal workers, workers for the federal government. Um, but they really 
uh, lose a lot of their influence post-1877, uh, post-Panic of 1873. Uh, two longer-term uh, impactful labor unions are the Knights of Labor uh, of Terence Powderly's uh, imagination. Uh, they first go public uh, in 1881, um, and they're going to be unique in that they allow for African Americans and women to join. Uh, and they don't want to go on strike. They don't stop working. They want to use arbitration or discussion to change their um, their conditions, their pay, etc. Uh, so they're going to uh, have a huge, huge, rapid growth uh, about through the middle of the Gilded Age. By 1886, they're going to have uh, almost three quarters of a million people, seven hundred thirty thousand. Uh, but with the Haymarket Riot affair uh, or the Haymarket uh, Square riot. Uh, we're going to see a huge decline in their power uh, as they go on a huge, huge, huge strike for May Day in places like Chicago and all over the country. <clears throat> um, some anarchists that have nothing to do with them uh, join the protest. Uh, somebody, we don't know who, throws a bomb. Uh, a bunch of policemen are killed, uh, and it really does damage their credibility in public opinion. And uh, the most long-term successful labor is labor union is the AFL, or the American Federation of Labor. Uh, they have very small goals, uh, economic, not the kind of social goals like the Knights of Labor are pushing for. They just want economic goals for their members. Uh, they just want better working conditions and more pay. Uh, they're going to be led by Samuel Gompers. And at the very beginning, they're only going to uh, allow for skilled workers to join the union. Uh, they're going to have a slower growth of progress, a slower growth of progress. But later on in the 20th century, they're going to have a bunch of huge uh Impact, and they still do to this day. Uh, however, despite all of this, uh, at every single time, every single turn in the Gilded Age, labor is going to lose. Um, big business is going to win in every single disagreement because big business has more money, big business has more resources, and big business has the government backing them. Uh, two examples of big business, big business winning and labor losing are, of course, the Homestead Strike uh, at Carnegie's Homestead Steel Plant by Pittsburgh. Um, they tried to go on strike, they try to walk out, they try to uh, stop work. They hold out for five months and eventually they have to go back to work because of government action. Uh, and the, in a, the Pullman strike, it's another similar deal. Uh, it's when we start seeing Eugene Debs, another important labor union name for, for later, but an important name in this time period as well. Um, talking about railroad uh, workers and, and Pullman cars, but eventually the government steps in uh, and uh, forces the, the workers back to work. So that's our labor for period six. Uh, we also see uh, a significant amount of uh, westward expansion as we close the frontier uh, by the end of the Gilded Age. Uh, we have a variety of different quote-unquote frontiers, uh, all of them in the west. Uh, we have frontiers that are closed because of mining, places like Colorado, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, and Arizona. Where we're looking, we find gold in Colorado, which is a big deal. Uh, we find silver in Nevada, all of which really follow the uh, approach of what happened in California in the 1840s and early 50s. Uh, and then we also see, because of the mining frontier, all these miners who are coming from all over the world, we see the Chinese Exclusion Act passed in 1882, uh, largely because of push by Western states to limit Chinese immigration for mining. Uh, we also see uh, in places like Texas and Oklahoma, the cattle frontier, uh, the use of railroads, as well as refrigerated stock cars, as well as barbed wire. It's going to create a brand new industry in American history, which is beef. Uh, so now Americans are eating burgers and steak like never before. We largely were a chicken and pork eating country before the 1860s and 70s. Uh, and that's going to really close up the frontier in places like Texas. Uh, we also see the farming frontier being closed, largely because of the Homestead Act and people settling on the plains. Uh, it's a real, real rough life, uh, but it is uh, a huge change in the development of an, of an area of the country that was largely sparsely inhabited by Native Americans up to this point. And then with all of this expansion into places in the South, the Southwest, and the West, uh, we're going to have what we consider the closing of the frontier. Uh, in 1893, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner is going to write a very important essay titled The Significance of the Frontier in American History, 
uh, which, like the name says, is going to talk about how significant the frontier has been in American history. Uh, he's going to argue that the, the frontier has promoted uh, individualism, uh, uh, places for people to go find new opportunities. It's promoted independence. Uh, the frontier has pushed for democracy, which is incredibly true, because in this time period where we're, we're going to first start seeing women's suffrage, as are these states on the frontier? Um, and the frontier has always held out this idea that you can have a, a fresh start somewhere else to start your life over if you're unsuccessful in regular society. Uh, and and he has an argument that, that now that the frontier is closed, what next? Where, where are we going to uh, have our opportunities coming from? Where are we going to have people that are marginalized in society? Where else can they go um, for an opportunity since there is no more frontier? Uh, we're also going to see, because with any Western expansion comes Indian conflict, we're going to see the last Indian Wars, the last organized resistance by Native Americans. Uh, it's going to take place in the West in places like the Dakotas uh, with a series of Indian Wars um, that, that are worth noting. Uh, places like Little Bighorn, uh, Fort Laramie, um, the Ghost Dance Movement, uh, the Wounded Knee, uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre is considered the the final tragedy in this centuries long series of Indian Wars. Um, but by the end of the Indian Wars, there's not enough Indians left to to mount any sort of resistance. Uh, a lot of this treatment is going to lead to. Uh, a really important book published in 1881 by Helen Hunt Jackson titled A Century of Dishonor. Is that in here for you? A Century of Dishonor, which is going to argue that, that we should be much kinder, much more thoughtful of, of the Native American situation. Uh, and it's going to argue that we should try to start providing Indians with education, job training, Christianity, it, uh, white culture, basically, farming and industrial skills. So we wouldn't consider it necessarily a, a cultural win by today's standards, but it is important because it's the first time in the public discourse we're actually talking positively about um, obligation towards Native Americans. Uh, that book, as well as public opinion shifting, is really what gives us the Dawes Act, uh, which is uh, designed to break up tribal organizations uh, and really civilize or Americanize or white eyes uh, the Native Americans by distributing, giving them land, uh, giving them education, and and putting them into basically reservations with with white culture being pushed into uh, the way they should live their life. Also in the West, we see uh, the beginnings of what will become the conservation movement uh, as we realize how badly we have deforested parts of California, killed all the buffalo, uh, ruined the environment in the Midwest with farming. And we start seeing places like uh, Yosemite in California, Yellowstone as well, uh, becoming national parks and preserved from industry, preserved from exploration um, so that we, we keep some of our, our natural habitat. Uh, some names to know for conservation, Carl Schurz as Secretary of the Interior, um, the Sierra Clubs, very, very important, uh, and then uh, John Muir, uh, he founds the Sierra Club, uh, the creation of Arbor Day, the Audubon Society, and then later people like Teddy Roosevelt as well. Uh, with the Last West becomes this approach of a new or new or, or kind of new South. It's largely going to be championed by a man named Henry Grady. Uh, he's a newspaper editor in Atlanta of the Atlanta Constitution. Uh, and he's going to argue that, that the South needs to become more self-sufficient economically. You guys might remember from class that I've always argued that the South um, has always played something of a mercantilist role to the industrial North um, in just simply providing the raw materials to the factories and the textile mills of the North. And Grady's going to agree with me. Uh, and he's going to argue that in order for the South to become successful economically, we're going to need to become self-sufficient, not reliant on anybody else. Uh, through capitalism, capital investment, the attraction of investment, uh, a push towards industrialism. We need to industrialize, which of course they could have done 50 years ago, but they just choose not to because they're the South. Uh, so we need some more industrial capacities. We don't just get buy our industrialized goods from the North. And transportation. Uh, we need to start getting on board with the railroad idea, um, with the... Uh, growth of infrastructure idea, and that will create a more self-sufficient South. 
However, we're going to see continued poverty in much of the South. There's a couple ex a couple exceptions. Um, Memphis, Tennessee becomes a big industrial city. Uh, Richmond, Virginia uh, has uh, become a, a little more industrialized. Um, New Orleans becomes more industrialized as well. Um, but but uh, the big issue is that m much of the southern economy is still based on agriculture and still based largely on cotton, which can continue this cyclical poverty in the south because when you're fully reliant on one crop, one thing for your economy, uh, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, there's also continued poverty in the south because a lot of the financing, a lot of the money for this attempt at industrialism is going to come from northern companies. So despite the fact there is some industrialism in the South, much of the profits will still be sent to northern banks and northern pockets. We also see a continued process of sharecropping for both white and black farmers uh, being stuck in a cycle of what's similar to economic poverty or stuck on the land that they have to farm because they are so far in debt because of the farming process, uh, as well as, as really still in the South through the Gilded Age up to much, much later, a huge lack of education, both in terms of book smarts and also industrial training smarts. So the South is really an, an uneducated uh, workforce. They got a late start in industrialism, so they're still going to be kind of behind the eight ball. Uh, also in the South, we're going to see democratic control after 1877, after Reconstruction falls apart, what's called the Redeemers of the South. And through a variety of approaches, they're going to keep African Americans subjected to uh, second class citizenship, uh, if citizenship at all. Uh, the Supreme Court's going to agree with them, ruling in both the civil rights cases and Plessy versus Ferguson that segregation is a okay, uh, and that the government doesn't really have to play a big role in forcing uh, progress, if as we would see it for anybody, specifically African Americans, uh, and then people pe uh, a policy of of lynching and grandfather clauses to keep African Americans from exercising their right to vote or exercising other rights, uh, which is going to keep the South really resembling a similar version to what we had before the Civil War. Excellent. Now, to all these problems that we're going to see farming-wise, um, the Homestead Act, and, and you can refer to your text if you want to go into specifically into more of the farmers' problems, um, we see the farmers begin to organize first with what's called the, the Grange Movement. Um, it's more of a social and educational organization. Uh, farmers live far away from each other and they have no social interactions. So creating cooperatives uh, to try to influence uh, being taken advantage of by railroads, being taken advantage of by big business. Uh, they're going to actually make a little bit of progress. They're going to get a very important Supreme Court case of Munn versus Illinois passed, um, which allows for states uh, to regulate businesses of a public nature. So basically regulation of railroads. Um, which will help the farmers because the railroads are taking advantage of the farmers by charging them too much and changing their rates, etc. Uh, unfortunately, just nine years later in Wabash versus Illinois, the Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court's going to overrule their prior decision and say, no, states don't get the right to regulate any industries because that is a federal government job. So a little bit of progress and that's taken back. However, also in 1886, we have the passage of the Interstate Commerce Act, which is largely aimed at regulation of railroads. Uh, and it, again, it's a step in the right direction. Um, later in the 1880s, 1890s, we see the creation of Farmers' Alliances, which is more of an economic and political. So the Grange being social and educational, that uh, Farmers' Alliances become more ec asking for economic and political support. Uh, and they're going to create what's called their Ocala platform when they meet in Ocala, Florida. Uh, and really, they're just trying to address the problems of rural slash farming America. And they're going to say, we want things like lower tariffs, direct election to senators, income tax, uh, federal government's regulation of banking, uh, all of which will later get picked up by the populist party. Cool. Now, uh, with all this, we're going to see a huge growth of urbanization, and a lot of it's fueled by immigration. And we consider this, quote unquote, new immigration. We consider this new immigration because it's different than our, our last or older wave of immigration that was largely northern and western Europe. This new immigration is going to come from places like Italy, Hungary, Greece, Russia, and people are – these immigrants are in general going to be less educated, less democratic in their backgrounds and beliefs, uh, less English-speaking, less white, and therefore going to face a ton of discrimination. Um, they're going to be a series of restrictions 
uh, on immigration uh, beginning in 1882, we've already talked about with the Chinese Exclusion Act, but also passed in that year as an act limiting immigration of what are called at the time undesirables or people with mental health, physical health problems, um, etc. Uh, in 1885, we're going to pass a restriction on temporary workers, workers that just come for six months to make a bunch of money and then leave. Uh, by 1892, we have created Ellis Island's uh, Immigration Center in New York at Ellis Island, uh, in which for the first time, immigrants are going to be subject to a health and wellness examination to come in. Uh, by 1917, we passed a literacy test to make immigrants pass before uh, able to come in. And all of these uh, limits or restrictions are going to be supported by labor unions because, again, the more people that come, the less um, powerful you are working-wise. Um, nativism is going to feel a lot of the restrictions as well, as well as social Darwinism. A lot of the, the thinking is that these people are, are less evolved and therefore should not be coming to America to, to silly our beautiful race. Um, and then a lot of this immigration problems are going to come to a head with the panic of 1893 when nobody has a job uh, and, and there's going to be a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment because of that. Oh, most of these immigrants are going to settle in large cities, places like New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco as well, uh, in really ethnic neighborhoods. Uh, it's the first time in American history we see places like a Chinatown or a Little Italy in which everybody that lives there uh, is from that culture, uh, looks the same, sounds the same, and that way they can share a little bit of their home culture uh, with while still being in America. Because of urbanization we see building up for the first time as Americans reach towards the sky for their space. Once room in cities is taken up, uh, we start building vertically, eventually with things like skyscrapers. But at the first time, we just like upward built uh, tenement housing. Because of all of this massive urbanization, we see a growth of suburbs. That's going to really continue through things like the 1950s. Um, but we see people that were living in the cities moving out of the cities because they don't want to share that land with all of these new immigrants. Uh, with urbanization, we're going to see a huge growth of machine politics as political machines uh, with people like Boss Tweed are going to be providing social services to the immigrants in exchange for votes uh, and taking advantage of the fact that a lot of these immigrants don't know the American system. They don't know the way of democracy and they're just totally okay trading their vote or votes or a lot of votes or their whole family's votes or their whole city block's votes in exchange for the resources and supplies they need. Not a bad trade. Uh, and because of all of these issues, we're going to see some pushes for uh, reform. Uh, one example would be settlement houses, which are really a direct response to machine politics. Uh, people like Jane Addams and Whole House uh, in places like Chicago and other big cities are going to... Uh, try to teach English to immigrants, uh, teach them job skills, teach them uh, American politics, and give them the resources they need so they don't have to rely on the political machine uh, and trade their vote away for something. Uh, we also see the creation of the social gospel, uh, which really does link uh, being a good Christian with uh, what's going to become in period seven, the progressive reforms, uh, or or taking Christian ideas of of take care of your neighbor and everybody uh, together and treat your uh, neighbor as yourself, those Christian ideals and applying them to society's problems. So taking a religious approach to the world and applying them to society. So both of these two are, are early examples of attempts at reform of, of the problems that really come from urbanization and immigration. Now, from a political standpoint, there's not really much noteworthy in the, in the Gilded Age uh, except for stalemate and patronage. Uh, both parties really are going to pursue an approach of the status quo. Uh, the Republicans are going to continue this policy of waving the bloody flag or waving the bloody shirt as they're going to try to keep winning elections on the idea that it's the Democrats that caused the Civil War, so you can't vote for the Democrats. Uh, and the Democrats are going to take the opposite approach in general, especially in the South, uh, of redemption, of, of getting back what we lost uh, in the Civil War uh, with an approach of what's called the Solid South or the Democratic South. Uh, where in the South, if you're white, you're voting Democrat because it's the Republicans who imposed Reconstruction on you. So we see a, a situation of stalemate as neither party really has any strong platforms for the most part, and both really just want to win elections, not really change anything. Uh, and that's going to lead us to patronage. 
uh, this giving away. The only reason to win elections is to give away jobs to your loyal supporters. Um, and when you hold office, you hold influence. And you hold influence, you can make money. Uh, and that's really going to change finally. Uh, of course, this system was started and used to be called the spoil system under Jackson. That system is going to really change uh, after uh, James Garfield is assassinated uh, over the issue of, of patronage. And we see the passage of the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1881, which starts the process of making sure the government's hiring qualified people, not people that just know the right person. Uh, finances are a big issue uh, in the Gilded Age. Really, though, the question is simply about like what to back our money with, with the Greenback Party. Uh, who wants to get rid of the gold standard and just print paper money. Uh, we have the populists who want uh, to propose a bi-metal system of gold and silver backing. Uh, and then we also have, the, uh, as usual, the huge question of tariffs, uh, which are going to go up in the 1880s and 90s to protect our big business. Uh, of note, politically, in the Gilded Age, we have a couple important groups. Uh, the first are the populists. Uh, and their creation of the Omaha platform. They meet in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892 to create their new party. And they are going to largely represent uh, the farmers in the West. Uh, they want to increase political power for common voters a couple ways. The first, uh, through direct election of senators. So we vote for our senators directly as opposed to them being voted by state legislatures. That increases political power for the everyday people, as well as the ability to use uh, initiatives, referendums, um, and recalls to change uh, politics from the ground up. Uh, they're also going to ask for things like a graduated income tax. Uh, so the more money you make, the more you pay. Uh, backing our money with silver as well as gold to make uh, money more accessible. Uh, and that if it's a public, if it's a, a industry that's for the public good, like railroads and telegraphs, the federal government should either own it or regulate it. Uh, Politically speaking, in the Gilded Age, uh, it's important that we understand the impact of the Panic of 1893, uh, which is, like I told you guys earlier, largely fueled by um, overexpansion of railroads, overexpansion of railroads, um, and it really does bring to a head that question of silver or gold, uh, which is settled in the election of 1896, uh, as William Jennings Bryan, with his famous cross of gold speech. Uh, runs against William McKinley, uh, and it's really an election that decides are we going to be a, a rural-based government, a farm-based government, or a big business-based government. The people speak. They vote for McKinley uh, as a Republican candidate, uh, showing us the downfall of the populist party, but really showing the importance of big business in politics uh, and big cities in politics uh, as McKinley is elected by a wide margin over Jennings Bryan, uh, which is a win for big business. Excellent. So to recap, uh, a couple of things that are worth noting from period six, uh, you have to know the emergence of monopolies, why they come from, why they come, where they come from, and what the impact on society is. You have to know social Darwinism and how that justifies the existence of monopolies. Uh, you have to know the pull factors of cities and jobs and urbanization uh, through both the New South and New Immigration. You got to know the labor unions, the AFL and the Knights. You got to know the growth of farmers uh, organizations, the Grange, the Farmers Alliances to the Populist Party. You got to know the last West, the Western expansion, and its impact on the natives of the Indian Wars, and you've got to know uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. So, uh, again, if you have any questions, please just write them down. I'll be happy to answer them in class, and I will see you shortly for your Period Seven Part One video. Thanks, guys.